Take your Bibles and turn to the Gospel of John, John chapter 17. As we move now to John 17, we are looking at the high priestly prayer, as it has been called, of Jesus. This is the intimate communion between God the Son in the power of God the Spirit with God the Father. They are talking, they are communing, and we have, through the inspired pen of the Apostle John, the record of this conversation, the record of this intimate prayer within the Godhead. I'm preaching a message I've entitled simply, Kept. Kept. And as we get through the text this morning, I think you'll see where I pulled that from. Well, about 250 miles due north of where we sit right now is a place that uh, is a very special place that's been designated to be the place where our nation's gold bullion supply is housed. Anybody know what it's called? Fort Knox. I've got a picture of Fort Knox. Fort Knox is quite literally a fortress. That's where most of our nation's gold reserves is stored. I looked at the markets on Friday, and I looked at the number of bullion cubes that are at Fort Knox, and the total amount of gold at Fort Knox as of Friday is $285 billion dollars just sitting in a vault. But more than gold is stored at Fort Knox, Fort Knox has been used to store and preserve things like the Magna Carta, the Gutenberg Bible, the English crown jewels. And in December 26th of 1941, after the United States was pulled into World War II following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence were moved from Washington, D.C., from the archives to Fort Knox to be guarded and protected until such time the war would be over and then they were moved back to Washington, D.C. Now the question is, why is Fort Knox such a good place to store priceless valuables? Because again, it is quite literally an impenetrable fortress. It's made of granite, steel, and concrete. The vault door is made of wraps of steel with interspersing concrete and granite. The vault door weighs 20 tons. The entire vault is encircled in strips of steel. Further, uh, getting inside that vault without authorization is impossible. There are multiple staff members, each of which have a specified combination known only to them that must be entered at the appropriate sequence in order for that vault door to even open. Further, Fort Knox is encircled not by one but two electrified fences and then another concrete wall and then finally there's a massive steel fence that encircles the whole property. It is impossible to get into Fort Knox and is impossible to get anything out of Fort Knox. It is quite literally the most secure place on the planet. But Fort Knox is not the most secure place in the universe. The most secure place in the universe is in the grip of God, in the grip of God, being kept by God. Now, here's the deal. The security of being kept by God is not the same as the security of Fort Knox. Jesus described also who it is who are being kept secure and safe by God. Interestingly, it's not everybody. It's not everybody who is kept secure by God. If you were here last week, just by way of reminder, multiple times Jesus described the appointed people who are in fact being kept by God. Jesus described them as a love gift from the Father to the Son. These appointed people. Notice uh, just by way of review, verse 2 from our passage last week, Jesus says, Since you, Father, have given him, Jesus, authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Look at the next one, verse 6. Verse 6 says this, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Move forward to verse 9. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world. Who's Jesus praying for? For those and only those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And finally, verse 10, the last verse we looked at last week, 
All mine are yours, Jesus says, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now, to be clear, Jesus loves all people. Jesus loves the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved who? The world. But here in this passage, the term world, the same word that's used in John 3, 16, is used 18 times. But the way it's used in this prayer is to draw a distinction, a contrast between those who, for whom he is praying and everybody else. I'm not praying for the world, Jesus says. I'm not interceding for the world. I'm only praying for these disciples, the 11 who were there, and then the other disciples who would believe because of their apostolic witness, and that includes most of you who are here today. This is who Jesus is praying for here in John 17. And what is he praying? He's praying that we would be kept. That we would be kept. Now let me ask you a question. Of anyone who has ever existed in the history of the human race, anyone who has ever uttered a prayer to God, who do you think is the most likely to have his prayers answered by God? Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is the most likely because he's always praying in the Father's will. And what he prays for right here in John 17, we can know for certain this prayer will be answered. How do we know that? For one, he prays within the will of the Father. Number two, he will accomplish what he is praying for through his divine power and his divine right. So look with me at our focal text beginning in verse 11. As we consider this concept of being kept, this is the word of the living God. Jesus says, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that's Judas, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth." Now, typically in the gospel accounts, whenever the gospel writers record Jesus praying, we don't get a record of that prayer. Typically, they describe him going away to a solitary place all by himself to pray. But here in John 17, they heard the prayer. Not only that, they recorded the prayer. We have the record from the inspired pen of the apostle John, this final prayer that Jesus prays just hours before his arrest hours before the cross, and hours before he's buried in a grave. This is indeed the context. He's walking between the upper room in Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives where the Garden of Gethsemane is, where Judas would eventually show up with that horde of soldiers and betray him into their hands. The full implications of this prayer are likely not registering with them at this point, but it's emblazoned on their mind and the realities would become true, truer and truer to them. That's what's interesting is Jesus starts off this prayer, this section of the prayer in verse 11 by saying, and I am no longer in the world. Wait a second, he's right there. <laughs> he is in the world. He's with them physically. He's there on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. How could Jesus say, I'm no longer in the world? Here's how. The cross, the burial, and the resurrection were such a certainty in the mind of Christ, he already sees them as having been accomplished. He already sees it as a completed work. He is dead set. I'm fulfilling the purpose and the will of the Father. And so he knows he is in the world, but he's not in the world. He's been a shepherd to this little flock. He has kept them safe. He's guided them. He's directed them. He's fed and nourished them. He's discipled and protected them. But he will no longer be there physically to have the capacity to 
keep them. And so he comes to the Father and he says, Father, keep them. Keep them. He, he does this with a simple request in verse 11. He says, Holy Father, keep them in your name. I would point out this is the only place in the entire 66 books of the Bible where God is referred to with these two terms, Holy Father. Jesus praying for us to be kept, he addresses God, Holy Father. What's significant about that? Holy means other, separate, distinct, set apart, unapproachable, holy, Father. What does Father mean? Compassionate, kind, caring, loving. And so he addresses God as Holy Father. And just as an aside here, I believe it's blasphemous to refer to any human being as Holy Father. Only God is Holy Father. And Jesus' request of the Holy Father is that he keep the disciples in his name. What does he mean when he refers to his name? We've considered this concept before. His name represents all that he is, his nature, his character. It's just not a moniker or a title. It's, it represents the totality of who he is by everything that his name communicates. God, your power, your holiness, your love, your mercy, your goodness, your grace, by that name, by that nature, keep these disciples, and not just the 11, but again, those who will believe because of their testimony. So here's a question for you. Look at this next slide. What are we being kept for? What are we being kept for? Are we just supposed to sit around like those gold bullion cubes in Fort Knox? Are we just supposed to be kept as trophies on the shelf? Well, as we go through this passage today and break it down, I want you to consider five reasons, five marks, if you will, for why Jesus prays to the Holy Father that we be kept, that we be kept. Let's consider them together. The first one is this. We are being kept for a singleness of heart. We're being kept for a singleness of heart. Again, verse 11, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Jesus is praying for the Father's protection of his disciples so that they would be one, so that they would have this singleness of heart. Let me ask you a question. What destroys the unity in a church? What destroys the unity in church? One simple three-letter word will suffice. Sin. Sin. Sin destroys the unity in a church, and that manifests in a lot of different ways selfishness, pride, unforgiveness, anger, dissension. So Jesus prays for the Father's protection that his church, his people, would be unified, that there would be a singleness of heart, that we would all be focused on the same mission and the same message, that we would be single in heart to glorify God. If you've ever had the occasion to go listen to an orchestra concert, one of the most striking things about any orchestral piece of music that occurs usually in just about every concerto is whenever the entire violin section is hitting these staccato strikes in unison, boom, 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 just the, the pitch and the tone and the precision, it just punches through. And as you're listening to it, it's like, oh, that is awesome right? If you've ever played the violin, one of the things that you learn very quickly is a critical component to playing the violin is that your instrument is in tune. It's got to be in tune. I've got a violin here that I pulled out of the cavern. <laughs> and a critical component of playing the violin, which I can't play, is that it is in tune. So the question is, if you've ever been to an orchestra concert, you know at the very beginning, before anything starts, you hear all these instruments kind of making noise, right? What are they doing? They're tuning. They're tuning their instruments. Now, let's go to the violin section. Does the first violinist say, okay, violinist, there is a G. 
He looks to violin seat number two. That's a G, tuned to the G. Uh, there's a D, there's an E. Oh, that was beautiful. There's an A. And then that first violinist goes to the second violinist, and the second violinist says, okay, he goes into the third chair, all down to the last chair. If that's the way they tune the violin section, guess what? The last chair and the first chair would not be in tune at all. They would be completely out of tune. An orchestra does not tune to one another. They don't tune to each other, to the instruments in the room. They tune to a single standard. It's called Concert A. Here's Concert A. It's A440 is the way it's known in the business. 440 means it represents the uh, oscillations per second of that A above middle C. So every tone that you hear is actually an oscillating sound wave, okay? An A, Concert A, is oscillating at 440 revolutions per second. And so they all tune to A440. That A I just played, it was about A432, so it was a little off. <laughs> A440, I have no idea. I'm just joking. That's the standard. They don't tune to one another. They tune to a common standard. Church, how will we have singleness of heart? How will we have unity as a body? Is it, well, I've got to try to make sure I'm tuned to this person. I've got to make sure I'm tuned to that person. I've got to make sure I'm, I'm G and hauling with these people. No, we all tune to the common standard, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, keep them what? In your name. That's the kind of unity Jesus is praying for. And when we have that kind of unity, friend, that's when we have the greatest kingdom impact. The Apostle Paul prayed for the same kind of unity for the church in Philippi, a great church, a godly church, but he still prays even for them to be unified. Look what he prays in Philippians 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. So Jesus first says, I'm praying, Father, that you keep them that they be kept, how? In your name, so that they have a singleness of heart, so that they be of one mind. Here's the second thing. He's keeping us in order that we would be saturated with joy. He's praying for us that we would be saturated with joy. I've told you before, Bible students, there's something in the Greek language that's called a henna clause. The word henna is normally translated in our New Testaments as that or in order that or for the purpose of. And we, there was a henna clause in verse 11, keep them in your name in order that they may be one. There's a henna clause in verse 13 as well. Look what it says. But now I am coming to you and these things I speak in the world in order that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Jesus is praying out loud and he's praying to the Father saying, Father, the reason I'm praying out loud and not secluded over on a mountain somewhere, but praying out loud for these knuckleheads to hear me is so that they can hear my prayer to you in order that my joy may be fulfilled in themselves. That word fulfilled means overflowing, saturated with the joy of Jesus. That's the reason he's speaking and praying out loud. Joy should be, don't miss this, joy should be the regular, consistent mark of the disciple of Jesus. We've all known church folk who had no joy, right? You see him coming and you want to turn and go the other direction. <laughs> no joy. I've determined there's one of two reasons why some church folk have no joy. One, they don't understand grace. They've not appropriated the grace they have. Or number two, they're church folk, but they're not God's folk. They're not genuinely born again. They're not saved. Joy is a distinguishing mark. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. It's a, it's a mark of being converted, of being filled with the Spirit. Paul issued this command also in Philippians chapter 4. He said, rejoice. That's the same word for joy. Have joy in the Lord always. Again, I'm going to say it. Have some joy, people. Rejoice. 
Don't look like you've been sucking on lemons all day long. Let your face know what your mind's thinking about the greatness of God. So he says, Father, I'm praying, Holy Father, keep them, keep them in joy. And that my joy may be fulfilled in them. I love the way Jerry Bridges put it in his book, The Practice of Godliness. He says, to be joyless is to dishonor God and deny his love and his control over our lives. It is practical atheism. To be joyful is to experience the power of the Holy Spirit within us and to say to a watching world, our God reigns. This is what Jesus prays for them, and this is what Jesus prays for us, that his joy would be fulfilled in us, would be overflowing in us, that we would be kept to be saturated with joy, that we would be kept to have a singleness of heart in a unified body. Here's the third thing. He keeps us in order that we would be separate from the world. Separate from the world. In fact, there are three verses in this section devoted to this concept of disciples being separate from the world. Let's look at them again. Verse 14, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of this world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Twice Jesus says, they're not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And Jesus gives this warning, the same warning he gave back in John chapter 15. Just know, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you too. You will be hated by this world. Why? Because we live by the word. I have given them your world, because, or word, excuse me, and because of that, the world has hated them. And then in verse 15, Jesus uses again this same word keep, which he used in verse 11. He says, keep them from what? From the evil one. Protect them, secure them, sanctify them from the evil one, from the attack of the devil. Where does this attack take place? In the world. In the world. And don't miss this important truth. Jesus does not pray that we would be removed from the world. Jesus does not pray that we would just enter into our little communes, our own distinct little groups. He says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. In fact, there are three things Jesus says he's not praying for in this passage, in this whole chapter. Verse 9, he prays that, he says, I'm not praying for the world. I'm only praying for those that you've given me. Later on, we'll see next week, Lord willing, in verse 20, he says, I'm not only praying for these 11. I'm praying for everyone who's going to believe because of their testimony. But in the section we're studying today, he says in verse 15, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world. This is where the well-known Christian phrase, in the world, but not of it, comes from. It comes from this passage right here, the prayer of Jesus. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. And Jesus' high priestly prayer is that we live in the world in the same way that he lived in the world. How did he live in the world? Did he isolate himself and go into seclusion into some little commune? No, no. He walked among the rank-and-file people of his day. He didn't dress differently than them. them. He didn't wear his hair uh, a certain way with the hard part on the side. He didn't he look like they looked. And sometimes we call this incarnational. His ministry was he took on human flesh. He moved into the neighborhood. He moved in among them. And this is the same way we are to be in the world. And God uses that. But in the world, but not of it. And so Satan's attack on the church, particularly, is very insidious. If I were to ask you, how do you see Satan attacking Christ's church in America today? You might offer some suggestions that are some very overt attacks. Well, the disintegration of culture and society. Man, that's an attack, satanic attack on the church. Or you might point to the erosion of religious liberties upon which this free society was founded, that those things are being removed and, and gone away. And those are certainly satanic. 
But I would say that's not the most insidious attack of Satan against Christ's church. It's not from the overt attacks from the big bad world out there, but it's from the infiltration of worldliness in here. That's how Satan destroys the church and the witness of the church. Not just by the bad people out there uh, doing things or saying things against Christ and his church. It's worldliness infecting Christ's church. Worldliness infecting Christ's church. There should be a distinction with the way we believe. There should be a distinction with the way we speak. There should be a distinction with the way we behave. And there are many so-called churches today that have believed the philosophies of this world and have adopted the patterns of this world that really don't look much different from the world. And so when someone in the world is seeking the answers to life's most important questions, why would they ever consult one of those churches when they're going to get the same bill of goods they get everywhere else? It is a separate, distinct, holy church that can have the greatest impact for the gospel and for the kingdom. Students, as you all go back to school this week, some started last week, some of you are starting next week, right? It's going to be the tendency for you to just go along with the crowd. It will be the tendency for you to just go along with the flow. But you know what? Dead fish go with the current. It doesn't take anything to go with the current. It doesn't take anything to go along with the stream and the flow. Dead fish follow the flow of the current. But those fish that have a purpose go against the flow. They swim upstream. They go against the current, and by so doing, they have maximum impact for the kingdom of God. And Jesus comes and he says, Father, keep them. Keep them separate from the world so they can have the greatest influence in the world. Here's the fourth thing Jesus prays that we would be kept, that we would be kept sanctified in the truth. Sanctified in the truth. Verse 17, very familiar, famous verse. Jesus prays, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. I pointed out earlier that Jesus addresses God with this title, Holy Father. Only time it's used the entire Bible. That word holy, holy, it's a descriptor of the nature of God. It's the, the Greek word hagias. Well, here in verse 17, verse 17 begins with the verb form of that same word, hakiazo. So what Jesus is doing, he's praying to the Holy Father, Holy Father, will you holify your disciples? Sanctified, consecrated, Set apart, Father, would you sanctify, set apart, consecrate my disciples? Holify them. How? In the truth. Your word is truth. Truth. Think about it. Who is Satan? He's the deceiver. He's the father of lies. He's the counterfeit. He's the source of all deception. And the only way to live separate in the world that is under the control of the evil one, the father of lies, is if we live according to the truth. He's lies. The word of God is truth. We must live according to truth. And listen, that's why here at Lookout Valley Baptist Church, every class, every D group, every study, every sermon is from the Bible. It's from scripture. It is the truth. Why? Because Jesus said as much. Sanctify them in the truth. But this sanctification process of disciples, of children, of adults, doesn't just happen in here for an hour and 15 minutes on Sunday morning. It should be a work that happens every day in our individual lives and in our individual families. It's something that should be regular, consistent, ongoing priority. I want you to notice the instruction God gave the people of Israel 
regarding their familial engagement with the word. Notice what he said in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He says, And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Now, I'm going to identify two ways by which Deuteronomy 6 describes how our families should engage with the word. Again, this is not talking to the church. The church doesn't even exist yet. This is to families and to leaders of families, two ways. First of all, it happens organically, and it happens in an organized way. Organically, the text says you do it when you're talking, when you're sitting in the house, when you're walking by the way, when you're lying down, when you get up, just you talk about the word. But also, there is an organized, didactic type of way this should happen in our families. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Here's my challenge to you, parents. School began this week. This is an opportune, opportune time to begin a regular, consistent time of Bible instruction with your children. Right now, this week. Don't wait until next week. We began doing this 25 years ago when Aubrey went to school. During the school year, every weekday that our children go to school, they are at our table 15 minutes early before it's time to get ready to go for an organized time of destruction, instruction, not destruction, instruction. <laughs> Sometimes I have to do a little destruction or deconstruction. So it's organized. Now, what does this look like? From the time they were in kindergarten until they get through college, if you're living under my roof, you're going to be at the table every morning during the school year. Sometimes we've read the whole Bible through cover to cover in a year. Sometimes we read devotional books or devotional studies on the Bible app. There's so many things at our fingertips. Last spring before Easter, when our whole church was reading through 50 Th Reasons Jesus Came to Die by John Piper, we read that every morning. That was our devotional. We've memorized not just verses or passages, but whole chapters in the Bible. It'll take us a month. We've memorized as a family, Romans 8, Romans 12, Ephesians 2, uh, Hebrews 10, John chapter 1. Committed these things to memory. A few years ago, I had a dad in our church call me, said, I need you to, I need to set up a time to come meet with you. And he came to talk with me, and he shared with me how one of his teenage children had been sneaking out of the house at night and doing things that teenagers do when they sneak out of the house at night. This is not my first conversation with this kind of a situation. And so I asked him what I've asked dozens of parents. First thing I ask, tell me what your family devotional time looks like. And immediately, he kind of looked down. Well, I've not really done a very good job of that. Dads, if you want your child to forsake the faith, forsake the scripture in their lives. Moms, if you want your daughters to be promiscuous, forsake the scripture in their lives. I'm not saying it's 100% foolproof. They're human beings. They're little demons. <laughs> They're going to make bad choices. But to the extent you diligently teach them the word is the extent to which the Father will keep them sanctified. You get it? We're not playing games with our kids. This week, school started. Train them in the word. I'm not telling you this. The only means Jesus has given you to disciple your children is the Bible. That's it. Sanctify them. Holify them. Set them apart. How? In the truth. I told that dad a couple years ago. You know who the senior pastor of your child is? Not me. It's you. You know who the chief shepherd of your child's heart is? 
It's not me. It's you. Dads, this, this responsibility principally falls on your shoulders. Jesus says, Father, I'm praying for these disciples. I'm praying for all those who will believe because of their witness that you keep them. And the way you're going to keep them is that they be sanctified, holified in the truth. That leads to the fifth and final reason why he prays for the Father to keep us, that we would be kept secure and safe in order that we would be sent on mission. Sent on mission. Here's what we need to grasp. Jesus did not entrust us to the Father's care and again entrust us to the Father's truth so that we could be in this holy huddle. He entrusted us with a mission, a mission of the kingdom. Notice how he put it in verse 18. As you, in the same way, you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Just like God the Father says, son, it's time to go. You're on mission. You're incarnating. You're taking on human flesh. You're going into the world. In the same way, Christ says to us today, I'm sending you. But we gather here to worship Jesus. We live and we leave on mission. Every moment, every minute, every day, we're to be on mission. Well, what does that mission look like? The same mission Jesus was on. As you sent me, the same mission. He's sending us. What is that mission? Let's go all the way back to John chapter 3. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Look at the next verse, verse 17. He says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Friends, the same mission God gave the son is the mission the son has given to us. Two parts. One thing we're not called to do and something we're called to do. We're not called to condemn the world. That's the Holy Spirit's job. We're not called to sit in our fortress and lob hand grenades spiritually over the walls hoping we take somebody out and call that evangelism. That's not what we're called to do. We're sent that the world might be saved. We're sent with a gospel message. And I admit, this message is not a warm, fuzzy message. Because the gospel says this, every single one of us are reprobates. Every single one of us are depraved sinners deserving of the wrath and the judgment of God. And the only way you can escape God's judgment is by repenting, turning from your own life of lordship and rule, repenting to God and placing your faith in the finished work of Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection. Not your own merit, not your own good deeds, not putting things in your your scale, I'm doing all this good stuff, trusting only in the merit and the goodness of Christ. This is not a message people want to hear. It is an offensive message, but it is the only message that saves. As you sent me into the world, Jesus says, I'm sending them. How? He moved into the neighborhood. In the world, not of it. He walked and talked and he dined with the rank and file members of society. We are kept by the Father, secure by the Father. Now, the security of Fort Knox is such that nobody can get in and nothing can get out. It's not the same security that we have in Christ. The security we have from the Father is this. We're in the world. We're going to let anybody in. And we're not keeping stuff from getting out. We want to get it out. We want to get the message out. We want to proclaim the truth. If I look at the very last verse of our passage, then we move to a conclusion one last time. Verse 19, and for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Not sure why the translators did this, but it's the exact same word in Greek, consecrate and sanctified. In other words, for their sake, I holified myself that they also may be holified in truth. 
I consecrated myself that they may be consecrated in truth. I sanctified myself in order that they may be sanctified in truth. Now, I'm afraid sometimes we get this concept in our minds because of the stereotypes we've seen of holiness people, (laughs) that that's what it means to be holy, to kind of dress funny, wear long skirts, uh, have long hair, maybe put little things on the head for women, you know, plain shirts for men, suspenders, goofy looking hats. This is what it means to be holy. No, this is not it at all. This is not it at all. We're called to be holy, but not weird. You with me? We're different, yes, because we believe differently. We behave differently, but not weirdos. We're supposed to, we can't impact and influence the culture that way. So holiness for the Christian, again, doesn't mean getting in our holy huddles like Fort Knox, throwing stink bombs of condemnation, but living differently because that's how the message of the gospel is commended to a lost world. We live controlled by the Spirit of Christ, producing the fruit of the Spirit, and that is indeed different. That is holy, and that leads to my last thought. As we are kept in the world and not of it, we will be distinct. This distinction makes the claims of the gospel believable to the world in which we're sent. 